I think most of that understanding for me comes from getting still and quiet. And so I have to remove myself from stimulation. So I would not sit in this seat because this is my office and my sort of, you know, studio. So I would sit somewhere else. I would get myself in sort of a quiet space. I would close my eyes and really tune into what I feel in my body and in my mind and in my heart, in my stomach, like what I'm noticing, where are things showing up? And does it feel like truth is a question I ask. And is it connected to my purpose? Because when we start building things that we get attached to in terms of financial outcomes, I think that throws us off track. All right, welcome to The Boost, conversations with people promoting mental health. And I'm delighted to be here with Megan Gunnell, who's the founder of Thriving Well Institute. Uh, she also has a Facebook group that you may have heard of, Thriving Therapists, where she's the admin. And uh, Megan, it's great to see you. We just talked recently. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. It's always a joy to have a conversation with you. Likewise. Yeah, thank you for being here. And you interviewed me, I think it was live stream, right? We did. On Facebook. We did to the membership community. The Elevate members had a wonderful conversation with you. And that was very well attended. We really enjoyed that. And yeah, we just always love connecting. Gosh, I love to hear that. It's I, I have some imposter syndrome and some <laughs> like fear of echo chambers, like that I'm just doing these like podcasty things and like just shouting it out into the wind. But you have the audience that you've built over time. And so I think they call themselves the elevators even, which I love. I just love that name. It's so fun. And you bring so much positivity to it. So to plug into an audience like yours is like really cool. I think we talked LinkedIn and growing a practice in different ways through marketing, but that was a lot of fun. It was great. It was very informative. And yeah, we try and elevate to really focus on all the ways we can elevate our impact and elevate our income as therapists. So there's lots of things we can do to scale our business. And a lot of therapists, I think, need just a little more accountability and guidance with that. So from the Thriving Therapist Free community, we also have that smaller paid membership, which is, I just delight in that community. The members are so full of growth mindset and they're so encouraging of one another. They're willing to be vulnerable. They're trying new things. They're really stretching beyond their comfort zone, which is a place I like to live and breathe. So it's been really joyful to be part of that. And I was so delighted to have you as a guest. So thanks for that. Oh, thank you. Well, your expertise is right in the wheelhouse of probably a lot of people who are listening. We do attract clinicians and we also attract marketers and many of them are working with, you know, whether it's providers or clinicians, therapists, the term is sometimes interchangeable, but the point is that they're, they're helping these professionals, you know, make impact and communicate their impact out into the world. So mm -hmm. we can talk income elevation and we can talk impact elevation among what we, what we get to today. But first we'll always do what we do, which is the virtual hug and the shameless plug. So give us your virtual hug, please, which is somebody or something you're thankful for today. Well, on the top of my mind today are my two college uh, student kids. One is in a master's degree far, far away in Sweden, and one is in her bachelor's degree pre-med at Michigan State, not too far from me. But I'm so proud of my kids. I really feel grateful for my relationship with them. They continue to teach me lots of things about how to be a better person, how to be a better parent. I don't know. They, they just blow my mind when it comes to courage and bravery. So. I'm thinking a lot about my kids. I'm going to get to see them at the end of this month. We're taking a family trip, so I'm really looking forward to that. But I'm just going to do a little virtual hug shout out to Elliot and Hannah. Elliot and Hannah. Have you been over to Sweden? We have. We have. And Elliot has come to see us when we host different international events over in Europe, too. So it's been really fun to be able to, you know, cross paths with him over there. And we're hoping he's going to come back to this side of the pond in the summer. So maybe we'll see him in the D.C. area when he's done with his master's degree. Mm, that's awesome. Uh, that's wonderful. I can't imagine having college age kids, but we have one heading that way. I mean, she's she's eight. 
but it's like tomorrow she'll be 17, you know, <laughs> it is like, in a blink of an eye mm-hmm. blink, and it'll be, it'll be there. And, and I can't imagine her going off to Sweden, but I don't know. <laughs> we'll see what happens. You never know. I mean, it's been a great secondary education for him, for sure. So it's been fun to have that international exposure. That's awesome. Well, give us the shameless plug, which is tell us about the work you're doing, what you're building, what you're focused on and how it's helping people. Well, I guess I'll start with the Thriving Therapist community, which has kind of taken over my life in the past couple of years. I started that just to, you know, be kind of a small place for therapists to connect with one another and learn a little bit more about building and scaling their business as a psychotherapist. And we have quickly grown to 20,000 members and We're doing all kinds of things for that community now with regards to coaching, courses, live events like retreats and summits. I wrote a number one best-selling book on how to thrive as a therapist, which I'm really proud of. And yeah, we have really grown as a community and I feel very protective of that space because it's such a sacred group of therapists that are really, again, willing to, you know, share what their wins are and their challenges and seeking guidance on how to, you know, continue to thrive in their personal lives and professional lives. So, yeah, along with retreat building and a few other fun things that I do on the um, other end of my business, I really just focus almost daily and exclusively on the Thriving Therapist community, which has just been a joy and a very surprising turn to my business goals <laughs> professionally. <laughs> you're so pro. You're so great. I mean, you're, I can see why you would rise to the top of an organization like that or be first among equals with an organization within this Facebook group, helping therapists thrive. What Talk a little bit more about what your mindset was just before you started that group. And then what was your sort of initial vision or goal for that group? And then what did it turn into, whether or not that was in your vision? I love this question. So when I opened the Thriving Therapist Facebook community, it was December of 2019. Little did we know that the world was about to change. And I started it because I was interacting on other large therapist Facebook communities. I was sharing a little knowledge and some tips and tricks on, you know, what worked for me in terms of building my, you know, solo private practice and building retreats, et cetera. And a lot of people in other pages said, you should start your own group. And I kept hearing that echo over and over. And one of my philosophies when it comes to marketing is listen to the audience that's in front of you. And I was listening to the people who were saying this on other pages. And I was like, all right, I mean, I don't know what I can share, but I'd be happy to try. So I opened this page. I had no idea what I was doing. I was a solo private practice therapist myself. I had a very busy caseload. I saw 35 clients a week, seven people in a row, Monday through Friday, without hardly a break for lunch. It was a really grueling schedule. And I wasn't really thriving myself when it comes to life balance and you know, making sure I had enough free time and downtime. I was pretty packed to the gills with clients and my caseload was booming. And I still decided to host this community because I think ultimately... I was lonely as a as a therapist. Um, it's a very isolating field. Even if you work in a group practice, you spend most of your time behind closed doors or in a virtual session with one client at a time doing really intense, important work. But it's very isolating. You're not doing a lot of like team and community kind of work. You're not collaborating, you know, with colleagues on a regular basis, typically. So I felt like, yeah, maybe I'll make this community. I'll make it like a space for me to feel connected to other therapists and just kind of share it with a few local therapists that I knew and see what happens. And I started sharing some tips and tricks for what I did to market my practice and build build my caseload and sort of be so successfully full. And then, you know, I started to pivot that a little bit. And I moved from, you know, those direct 35 clients a week, more into serving more people in an easier way. So really scaling up my business along the way. But as Thriving Therapists grew, I started hearing, again, listening to the audience that was in front of me, I started hearing their problems. I heard their pain points. I heard over and over again that 
Every one of us has had a very comprehensive graduate degree for becoming a clinician, but none of us had any information or guidance on how to own and operate a business. And that's very true across the board for, at least in the United States, the graduate degrees that we have to have as therapists. And so I heard them asking for guidance on like, first of all, how do you open a business? How do you become a solo private practice psychotherapist? And then second of all, how do you thrive in that business? And then beyond that, I heard people asking for ways to learn how to scale. So they wanted to learn how to build retreats or build a group therapy program so you could see more clients in less time or build a group practice and hire therapists to join your team so you could continue to take those referrals and not have to put those you know, clients on a wait list, for example. And going back to my own philosophy of listening to the audience in front of me, that's how I started to build sellable offers to my Thriving Therapist community, like seven online courses that I have, or coaching programs, or in-person retreats and events. So from the community, which was just a desire to create space for people to get to know each other and support each other and share resources and tips, it turned into a very uh, successful business in a very short amount of time, mostly because I was listening closely to the needs of the people who were joining my community. Hmm. Yeah. And, and as a therapist, I've, I'm not one, but I've heard enough times that even when you're in the room, you're sort of keeping yourself out of the room, you know, more often than not, or, you know, when you, when you see a client, maybe just out in the street, it's like, you kind of have to maybe act like you don't know them until they say hi to you. Like there's yeah. always this dif deference of just making sure hip, you know, HIPAA compliance and, and trust and privacy. It all makes a lot of sense, but Absolutely. yeah, where is, where is the space? Where's the group for the therapists themselves? So you identified that need based on sort of your own lived experience and then moved into it. And turns out that it resonates with thousands of people. Yeah. But but how do you listen closely? I'm thinking about this as somebody who runs an event, you know, and I I hear neat things that people say, but how do you really listen closely in a way that's effective for you to then uh, activate some of those ideas? I did it in three ways. I listened closely to the question that they answered to become a member of the Thriving Therapist private Facebook group. I asked them a couple membership questions. First, I asked, you know, are, are you in the right place? Like, are you the right person to be here? Because sometimes we'll have by accident a massage therapist or a physical therapist or some other type of therapist that wants to come in. And I'm like, no, this is just for psychotherapists or mental health, you know, providers. So I can rule that out right away to make sure our community is not full of people who are trying to advertise to us or people who aren't therapists. The second question I ask is, what do you need the most help with? And so that gives me a lot of information as I approve members to join the community with my team of moderators too. We look at those questions to really address, you know, what are people asking for? Because it changes over time. During COVID, people were like, I don't know how to move from brick and mortar office space to telehealth. So teach me how to do that. And I was like, oh, good. I'll do a Facebook live for that. You know, so that's one way by asking our members when they join the community, what's your biggest pain point? Essentially, what do you need the most help with? The second thing is developing a dialogue. So getting to know an audience by asking them questions and commenting on posts and preparing some, you know, different kinds of resources for them and different kinds of, you know, posts that I would write that were good for asking questions about what, what do you really need the most help with? Basically, what can I create for you? Can I create one-on-one -on -one coaching or do you want a course on this? Or, you know, I had to evaluate, would that sell too? Like, is it worth my time and energy to build this? But I never built anything, first of all, that I didn't do myself. And I never built anything that I knew wasn't going to answer the call of my audience because I wanted it to be effective. I want, I want to be efficient. I don't want to waste time. And the third thing I did was Facebook lives. So for about a year and a half, I would tune in at the same time, same day of the week, thriving Thursdays, Facebook live four o'clock, you know, in the afternoon, Eastern. And I would show up and I would have a whole bingo board of like ideas on my wall that were all different kinds of topics that I was collecting from my audience. 
So they would say they needed, you know, help with X, Y, or Z. You know, maybe it's like billing insurance or how do you handle charging for a no-show appointment or things like that. And I would have all these ideas. And then like right before I would go live, I would grab one of those ideas and just go live and say, we're going to do five minutes really quick. And I'm going to teach you something that I've heard you ask about. And then if you have more questions on it, you know, feel free to follow up with me. And that helped me build a lot of trust with my audience and help me establish my authority and expertise in the things that I know how to do. Now, I only have authority and expertise in my wheelhouse. I'm not trying to say I know everything about everything there is to know about being a thriving therapist, but I do know a few things about what works when it comes to filling a caseload and scaling your business. So I was just like trying to keep it in a very tight container of what I knew I could answer, you know, for my audience. So those three things really helped. And look how robust it is within that closed garden, let's call it, you know, staying in your lane is hard because one, you start to repeat yourself. And for me, it feels like everybody knows this thing that I know, right? But here you are continuing to, to prune and pruning drives growth, I think naturally. So to continue to stay within your wheelhouse and, and your area of expertise is, is brilliant because it's, it's very hard to actually niche down far enough. Mm -hmm. And, and then once you're there, you've got retreats, you've got a best selling book, you know, you've got, you know, you've got all sorts of act, act, ways to engage and activate the help that you're providing people. It doesn't have to be this world domination, you know, let's go, let's go conquer the continents. You're, you're like, you're working within your strength, it seems like. And I think everybody should do that. I feel like it's very easy to see when someone is trying to offer things to a community that are really outside of their expertise, that becomes a little scary, a little dangerous, a little bit predatory. I, I want to, you know, I always get kind of a weird feeling when I see ads for things where I'm like, wait, how, how is this, like this person now doing this or something? Yeah. I really think it's just like finding a niche in our field as therapists. We can't be generalists. We can't be experts in everything. Of course, our graduate degrees try to prepare us to treat anyone when we leave our degree. Yes. But as we hone in on our skills over time, we really do develop a specialty or a niche. And I think that same thing holds you know, true for coaches, for sure. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm exploring the idea and committed to the idea, actually, of doing a LinkedIn course, like a how to do LinkedIn, because that's what I do best. Mm -hmm. I am not good on meta. I'm just not good at it. And, you know, I jumped back in maybe a year or so ago. I just kind of accepted all the people who wanted to be friends with me. I don't know most of them. You know, it's like not in my target demographic from a business standpoint, certainly, or ideal customer profile, although I see those come through too. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't do a great job of, you know, I don't have a group. I don't have an active kind of conversation on Facebook. And, and maybe that's a missed opportunity. Uh, but LinkedIn for me is kind of where... I've thrived. And so I do feel like at this point with the, with the followers I have that I think there's probably people out there who could use a little bit of, of help figuring out really how to actually connect with people. That's what I'm most passionate mm -hmm. about on LinkedIn. That is really needed. I think our audience would love to see a course on that for sure. And I agree with you that it's fine to just focus on one or two spaces. I am the same way you described about Meta with Instagram. I'm not like Instagram, you know, hip, I guess you could say. I don't understand how to create reels. I don't do that very easily. I don't live in that space. I find it to be a little bit competitive or I don't know. I, I don't always feel good when I go to Instagram. Maybe it's just like seeing what other people are doing kind of triggers something in me, but I just feel much more comfortable on Facebook. I've been using it for many years just personally. And so, you know, going to that space feels really easy, you know, for me. So I think that's a takeaway for any of your listeners around 
you know, when you're starting to focus on marketing, it doesn't have to also be in every single space. We don't have to be doing, you know, everything from YouTube to TikTok to LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, X, whatever, and Meta. I mean, we don't have to do it all. So I always tell people too, when I'm coaching, like, let's just pick one or two of these. Where are you most comfortable? And where do you think your audience is? You know, because the predominant grouping of my audience, at least right now, is living in this Facebook community. And they're certainly in other spaces as well, but that's where I show up and that's where they show up to have conversations with me too. So it works really well for right now, but I, yeah, I don't know if one day, you know, that will shift, but yeah, we don't have to do it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that point. That's a great reminder, whether we know it in our heads or not, it's like such a great reminder. And yeah, LinkedIn, I think, I think I've got maybe, let's see, 2,200 people following our company page. On Instagram, we have maybe 150 people following our Instagram account, just because we started, we started late and I'm not great at it. And there is something kind of, there is something like a little bit of like a, a hustle culture or like, you know, like there's the fashion and beauty culture. Like it's a very interesting, different world than LinkedIn. You know, LinkedIn is like walking into an office. Yes. Kind of, you know, it feels like, but yeah. what I love about LinkedIn, it's like most people are actually working at a company and Facebook, you've done the smart thing, which is like, this entire market is not my market. Mm -hmm. You, I kind of need to know why you're here. And mm -hmm. yeah, if you're the physical therapist, this probably isn't the place for you, you know, mm -hmm. nice of you to join the group or whatever, but mm -hmm. you may be better off in another, in another place and forget the name of the book, but there's, there's a wonderful book that talks about that in terms of designing events, which you do too, which is like, it's a, you kind of think of it as a family reunion. And not everyone is invited to the family reunion, you know, like mm -hmm. the, the brother's girlfriend that they just started dating last <laughs> week is like, probably, you're probably not getting an invite to the family reunion, <laughs> but once you're in your family for sure. But, but it's important to have a, who should be here and who shouldn't be here in terms mm -hmm. of uh, using the time well. I think that's a great point. And I think that's one of the things that makes my community so strong is because we have been so careful about vetting our members. So, you know, we do not allow virtual assistants or anyone who's essentially not a therapist, except my mom, she can be in there. <laughs> because let's be honest, in the very beginning... <laughs> Mom was like the only one watching the Facebook lives that I was real. I was like, hi, mom. Hi. I was like, like, do you I want have another question, honey? Yeah, I know. She Sometimes she'll write honey under, con she's like, I love that picture, honey. I'm like, thanks, mom. I'm like, but I have her in there because I love her and I want her support and I want everybody to know my mom and hoping that she can come actually to a future summit. It'd be so fun to introduce her to everybody. But yeah, in the very beginning. Go for your mom too, because my mom, yeah, my mom cool. asked me the other day, like, so are you a blogger? Are you just a blogger now? <laughs> I'm like, oh no. What do you do? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I interrupted you. Oh my God, no, that's so funny. No, I would love to. I mean, in the beginning, I really did just have a few friends and my mom and a few people and thriving therapists. But typically, you know, we're very, very, we're not typically, always, we are very cautious about who we bring in, which makes the community so strong because people also know they're safe to share things there that they know will be reaching the ears and eyes of only other peers and colleagues. So that's really important, I think, in the community where you're not going to be bombarded by a lot of sales pitches and, you know, people trying to say, I can do your billing or, you know, I can design your website or because a lot of other therapist spaces are aiming for, I think, large numbers in their community because yeah, sure. there are rewards for that. Let's be honest and clear about the size of your following sometimes can get you certain advantages. But I would rather sacrifice numbers for quality. And I feel like that has worked for me since we opened our doors. And I won't change that because I just feel really committed to making that space really private for the people who, you know, qualify to be there. Mm -hmm. You resonate at a very high level, it feels like to me, and you have this charisma that not everybody has. I don't have it. You have this charisma, which is like this magnetism or this drawing in of attraction. Do you feel like that in your life? Like, do you feel like the things come to you more often than you have to kind of go out and, and pursue things? That's how, that's how I would guess if I had to make a hypothesis, but I could be really wrong. 
I mean, thank you. That feels like a compliment. I appreciate it. I do it feel is. like I spend a lot of time sort of protecting my energy vibration. I don't know if that resonates, yeah. but like I do spend a lot of time making sure that I'm focused on integrity and intention. So I try to really make sure that when I'm deciding whether or not to, for example, host a retreat or you know, write my book or host a summit or whatever I'm doing, I first pause with a lot of intentionality around, is this aligned head, heart, and gut? You know, is this a yes for me intuitively, you know, mentally, like cognitively, intellectually, emotionally, is it, an, is it fully aligned with my mission and vision and who I am and what I'm supposed to be doing? And so I feel like when there's a yes for that, then there's this weird universal thing that you just described that happens where I say I'm stepping into it, you know, into the universe and the universe says, we'll make it easy for you. So <clears throat> I, I guess people would describe this in lots of different ways, but, and it might sound weird, you know, to people who are listening to this, but that's kind of how I operate. I also spend a lot of time in my own practices. I have a couple different meditation practices that I, you know, practice on a regular basis. I really watch what I'm doing, you know, in my free time and, you know, how I'm engaging and who I'm engaging with. And, you know, I, I carefully curate what I'm putting into my environment in terms of like messaging and what I'm reading and what I'm looking at, what I'm eating, you know? So I try really carefully to, I guess, protect my own energy level and vibration, if that makes sense. And maybe that's what you're picking up on, but I, I am joyfully connected to my purpose. I do feel very grateful for that, that I get to do things that I love doing. I mean, I feel very, very privileged that I get to build world-class retreats in stunning locations. And that's my job. And I get to see people transform and learn and grow and, you know, that I can teach people things and then I can share knowledge that I have and learn from them as well. That's like, that's like what gets me up in the morning every day. <laughs> so I feel very lucky for that. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Well, it doesn't sound woo to me at all, it, but I do have a follow-up question because I've been thinking about this a lot myself, which is learning more just recently about sort of the, the somatic response to decision-making and looking back at my life in retrospect and saying, oh, I certainly probably would have made a different decision if I was really listening so you can you can beg this question off, but could you could you talk through the head, heart, and gut, and maybe how mm -hmm. do you differentiate those three things? Because I believe, I mean, that is how to make decisions. I just don't know always how to get to each of those categories and kind of give it its own space. Is there mm -hmm. is there a, a tip or something you can you can give? I think most of that understanding for me comes from getting still and quiet. And so I have to remove myself from stimulation. So I would not sit in this seat because this is my office and my sort of, you know, studio. So I would sit somewhere else. I would get myself in sort of a quiet space. I would close my eyes and really tune into what I feel in my body and in my mind and in my heart, in my stomach, like what I'm noticing, where are things showing up? And does it feel like truth is a question I ask. And is it connected to my purpose? Because when we start building things that we get attached to in terms of financial outcomes, I think that throws us off track. So I have always forever, the last 20 years of my career, built retreats or built any aspect of my business really based on is it connected to my truth and is it connected to my purpose rather than saying I want to make 10 grand or whatever on this thing or I'd love to make this much. I am so blind to financial outcomes that a couple years ago when I went to visit my banker and financial planner guy, he was like, so what did you make last year? And I was like, you tell me. Mm. I had no idea, Steve. And that sounds irresponsible and ridiculous. All I know is I live in abundance. And if I have enough money coming in and I feel comfortable, I'm fine. I don't care what the numbers are. I really don't even know what they are until now my bookkeeper and accountant show me my P&Ls. Like, I have no idea. And I don't really care because I'm not attached to that. I feel well supported that way. And maybe that sounds 
again, really crazy to most people, but I don't aim to build things based on financial outcome attachment. So when I look at head, heart, and gut alignment, I sit down to say, does this feel like a yes? Does this feel like truth? Is it serving my highest good? And am I connected to my purpose and passion when I build this? And is it going to serve my community, you know, or the clients in front of me? Will this be of service? Is, uh, these are the questions I'm asking for. And what I'm listening for are sort of like feelings in my body, because I'll take you through a little exercise. And I did this at a retreat I hosted recently and people loved it. So I would love for you to try this too. So let's just go through this little exercise. It's really short and maybe you've heard it before, but it's really an easy way of doing what I'm describing. So for your listeners, I'd love them to just take a moment, close their eyes and you can keep your eyes open or closed, Steve. But I want you to imagine a sentence in your mind's eye that is 100% true. And it might sound like my name is Steve, you know, something that without fail is 100% factual. And when you say this sentence, I want you to think about and feel what you're, what you're noticing in your body. So when you say the sentence, what are you noticing about your heart, about your stomach, maybe your joints? your throat? What are you noticing in your mind? You know, just kind of let that soak in for a minute. Repeat the sentence. Feel what you're feeling. You might see a color. You might hear a sound. You know, it might be showing up for you in a certain way. No judgment, no attachment. Now I want you to say a sentence that's 100% false, like my name is Mary or something crazy. 100% false, Say it a few times in your mind's eye and notice what you feel in your body. And when you're ready, come on back and tell me what you noticed. Wow. Thank you. So I noticed that when I said my true statement that my shoulders dropped, my shoulders relaxed, I took like a a relaxing swallow, like I had been tense in my throat. And, and I noticed that kind of move down my body. And then I noticed or visualized with a little bit more prompting, like the awareness of like a beach scene being like not a color, but like an experience. Mm -hmm. And then when I did the opposite, like I got a little twitch or tick in my, the back of my neck. It was mm -hmm. like, it was like retightening the bolts Yes. Uh, Frankenstein's monster. And, and I just, and, 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 it, and then I felt my throat kind of tighten up as well. And I lost the vision. Isn't that amazing? And imagine if you did that test every time you asked yourself about making a business decision, you know, can you imagine if you sat for a moment and said, I've been invited to, you know, co-host this cool thing with somebody should I do that? Is that a yes for me? Is this in my own truth? You know, is it, is it a true thing? You know, and where do I feel it in my body? Am I getting a hard no? You know, sometimes you hear a hard no immediately and you don't know why, but sometimes we're so attached to a financial outcome that we don't want to say no, even though it's a no for us. I've said no to a lot of things. I had a colleague that I was supposed to run a retreat with and I, could not understand it because we had run things before together, but it was a hard no for me. And I could not understand why. And I felt like I was really letting her down when I said I couldn't co-host it. And it turns out at the time that she was out there out West hosting this retreat, my husband had an accident and broke his back in three places. And had I gone I wouldn't have been here to like take care of him and take him to the hospital and help my family and whatever. And I could not understand why I was getting a no, but it was just a no. I mean, there are other examples too, where people have asked me to be a speaker for something and I'm like, hard pass, I can't do it. And I don't know why everybody else is saying yes. And I feel like, why is it a no for me? And then later it's revealed either that person's mission and purpose is not in alignment with mine or, you know, something happened with the conference and people didn't show up for it or whatever it was. I was like, ah, okay, you know, I get it now. But I think we can't have clarity 
in head, heart, and gut unless we get still and quiet. And I feel like there's so much stimulation happening in our everyday lives and we're being fed all these messages and we're being influenced by all of these messages that it's hard for us to say, what's true for me? This is so valuable to me right now in my actual life. I really appreciate it, Megan. It's can't tell you how relevant it is. I mean, I, one of the transformative moments in my life was going to a silent retreat, you know, for a few days. And when I drove up to the monastery, I also lost cell phone service. And there's a lot of talk lately about not just intermittent fasting, but intermittent technology fasting. And some of those are very old traditions, but just the silence, just the reduction is sometimes mm -hmm. what it takes. So the stillness and the quiet as you listen to your heart and your mind and your gut mm -hmm. and go through those. And then you're really tapping into, I mean, I don't want to be cheeky about it, but like the, the matrix of past, present and future, like you're like with your husband's accident. I mean, mm -hmm. you're really relying on the universe or the the greater powers to say, no, actually, this isn't even feel like I'm saying this no, but this no is being said through me. Yeah. And yeah. I'm going to go ahead and accept that because uh, that's, that's boldness. So that's, in, that's an incredible um, way to make decisions with that kind of faith and trust. Well, I think it comes from being willing to trust, removing the ego, right? So if I didn't remove the ego, and I didn't lean into trusting my own truth, like that exercise I just walked you through, then I would say yes, because I would have wanted to go out there. It sounded like a beautiful location. I would have made money on it. It would have been a good opportunity for my resume. I had all these ego reasons to say yes, but I had an intuitive reason to say no. And so I have learned over many times of listening that the intuition is never going to misguide me. You know, so I I feel grateful that I've learned that and then I can lean into trusting that, but a lot of people I think are led with their ego which is mixed with fear. You know, a lot of times saying yes to things, you know, is ego driven and combined with our fears. Like what if I don't go? I won't make that money. I won't grow. I won't be, you know, expanding my opportunities. I won't be asked again or whatever. Those things are fictitious. They're part of our distortions and distorted thinking. So I don't know. I feel lucky and grateful that I've been able to my entire career be able to operate this way and work this way. And it's never failed me. I feel very lucky that I have learned how to do that. It really came from early training from a wonderful mentor that I had in music therapy when I was a music therapist. And she was teaching me some of these things very early on. And it sounded all very new age to me, but now I really understand it deeply and it works for me. So I think we have to find what works for us. And for me, this just feels like an easy way to make large scale decisions because I'm making big decisions. I mean, hosting conferences, like things that you're doing too, you know, you're in charge of a platform and your audience trusts you and you, I, I don't take that, you know, lightly. I mean, I take it very seriously. So I want to be sure that when I'm putting my energy into something, it's a 100% full body. Yes. You know, otherwise it's going to be hard for me to sell it. It's hard for me to like invite people to invest in those things. If I don't believe there's value in it or that it's going to serve our highest good collectively. So I think this is, I think this is related. Um, and I don't think it's conflicting, but help me figure this out. So there's a book I love. It's called the war of art. And I always have to think about the title because there's also the art of war. This is not that. <laughs> this is Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art. And he says something about how like Mother Teresa, if Mother Teresa had decided to go into telemarketing, <laughs> it would have been the easiest like thing for her. Like the universe would be like, here's your headset, you know? <laughs> yeah. Everybody but, will say yes to you. <laughs> <laughs> everybody will say yes to you. But he talks about how the resistance is the way. And that actually there's like this magnetism on the other side of resistance that if we can press through that or, you know, go through that obstacle, that's the treasure we seek. Uh, but your decision making head, heart and gut, like I think happens like before that and consolidates your power. So could you talk about also like when 
you've had to go through resistance. I mean, mm-hmm. when do you know I go, I, I break this wall, I break the ceiling, you know, when do you push forward and through? I love this question. And I feel like it has a lot to do with distress tolerance is what therapists call this. So being able to do something, to show up fully in a yes for you, whether it's speaking at a conference or building something new or taking a leap and a risk or whatever, a leap of faith with your business or decisions you're doing and being afraid at the same time, but letting that fear just sit next to you like a passenger in a car. So you're still driving, right? But it might just be a noisy passenger and you're like, just head to the back of the bus. I can't, you know, I can't drive this bus and listen to you. You're welcome to ride with me, but you're not going to derail the route. So a lot of therapists teach, you know, clients, and I've taught this many years with my own client population, how to do something that scares you and continue to do it, even though there's fear that's present. So I think that resistance for me, and I've done that a million times. I had to speak in front of conferences, you know, large audiences. It really scares me. It still scares me today. But the difference between people who say that scares me and I don't want to do it and the people who say that scares me and I'm going to move forward are the ones who sort of learn how to expand their distress tolerance. So we get more tolerant driving next to stress or distress, right? So, I mean, like publishing my book, I, I mean, the night before my husband was here, he would laugh out loud with us because he was like the night before that went live on Amazon. She was crazy. I was out of my mind. I was like, we got to tear it down, burn it to the floor. I was like, burn the whole thing down. We can't do it. We can't do it. We're going to rip it apart. Just shut it down right now. Tell Amazon, like stop the presses. I was freaking out because I had shared a lot of vulnerable truths in that book. And I was scared of like negative reviews or that people wouldn't find it useful, or they would say, I don't know, that they didn't like my writing style or that my story was stupid or whatever. I was so afraid. But then I kept saying, you wrote this based on a lot of evidence that your community was asking for it. You sat with the head, heart and gut evaluation. You know it's serving a purpose. It wasn't a money maker for me. Anybody that publishes a book, no, it's not, you know, it's not a money maker. But I wanted to bundle up everything I knew to be true about building and scaling your business into one affordable resource. And I was like, you know what? Put it out there and drive your bus forward, even though your fear is sitting right next to you saying, like, you know, you're not gonna be enough or it's too much, or you know, all those things that we fear. And then I just did it and I ripped that bandaid off and kind of, you know, jumped off the end of the dock without looking. And I'm so glad I did because I've had thousands of people write me and say, I wish I would have read this book three years ago or five years ago, or this is everything I've been waiting for, or thank you for sharing your truth and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, it's not for everybody and that's okay. But for the people who have benefited from it, that's why I did it. And that's why I'm glad I didn't let fear push my resistance to a no. That's beautiful. I didn't know that term, distressed tolerance. I did stumble across that visual of putting your fear in the back seat at some point. When I was doing long distance running, you can get into moments where it's it's very scary. You feel like you're pushing yourself to and past the limit. There's a, there's a story about Bruce Lee taking on like a student and they like run up this mountain and Bruce Lee didn't want the student to begin with, but then he's like, all right, we're going to do this. And so he runs up this mountain to the point where the student is like, I'm going to, I'm going to die, I think. And Bruce Lee says, okay, well then die then. Not because he wants him to die, but because he calls fears bluff. You know, he just says, okay, like, just go ahead and try to do that. And it's amazing what we can do when we can put fear in its place, but we can't We can't kill the ego. Like we can't, you know, like I guess you could try, but it has to go somewhere, you know, Mm -hmm. I think to be a complete person maybe or a complete experience, but who's driving and Mm -hmm. who's influencing the conversations and who's in the backseat along for the ride. I love Mm -hmm. that picture. Yeah, I think it helps a lot. I mean, I remember, was it Anne Lamott that said the difference between people who finish writing a book and the ones who don't, are the people who keep their butt in the chair or something like that. And I thought that's really, that's really what we're talking about. Like, it's about 
sustaining through those really painful points where you're questioning everything and wondering if you should keep going. And, you know, you start to get all this noise and chatter in your own head about whether or not it's going to be good enough or, you know, if, if it's too much or all those shame triggers come up and it is scary. I mean, I have that all the time, but I feel grateful that I've had enough practice, you know, and willingness to be vulnerable, to just be almost recklessly brave, you know, at times when it comes to just jumping off the end of that dock, it's like, let's not feel the water. Let's just plunge in <laughs> and see how it is. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you for everything you've shared. Thank you for these 45 minutes and we could continue to keep talking. I just love, I love and enjoy talking with you. So thank you. I'm going to go back and listen to this one to Cole more wisdom from you, but to kind of close, tell people exactly where to find you, that your channels, your Facebook group, how, and we'll put those links in the notes too. Yeah. If you're a psychotherapist or a mental health counselor, you're welcome to join us at the Thriving Therapist Facebook community. And you can find out more about me and what I do at thrivingwellinstitute.com. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks again, Megan. I hope you have a great day and we'll sign off. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure being here.